In last week's video, we looked at higher order functions or wrapper functions. We saw how this pattern is a great way to augment the behavior of your other functions while still maintaining a separation of those concerns. I wanna show you a couple of other ways that we can use higher order functions to wrap behavior in this video. And we're gonna look at four different ways that we can do this. And hopefully this will give you some inspiration for ways to use higher order functions in your own code. So let's take a look. The first one we're gonna look at is called optional. The idea here is that we have some function that throws an error sometimes, but we don't care about that in this particular use case. Maybe we just wanna call this function and if we get a response back, great. If we don't, that's okay, we don't actually need it. We can gracefully degrade somehow. And so the way this works is optional will take our function and of course it returns a new function. And this is the basis of our higher order function pattern, as we saw last week. The function that we return needs to take the same parameters as the function we pass in, and it needs to give the same return type. Now in this case, we're actually changing the return type a little bit, which is okay. We're saying it might return the type that the original function returned, or it might return void. Inside of our wrapper, we have a try catch block and we'll try to return the result of calling the original function. But if we get an error, instead we will just handle that error internally here. And we have an error handler argument that we could pass in when we wrap the function, but if it's not there, that's okay, we just will drop the error entirely. So you can see a use case of this down below here. We have this example sum function, and we can see that this will actually throw an error if the response would be greater than 10. Down here on line 19, we wrap our sum function because we don't really care about the case where our sum is greater than 10. And we actually include a handler here, which is just console.warn. All right, so now we can see we have two uses of this optional sum at the bottom, one that is 10 and one that would return 12. So if I go ahead and run this, you can see that we get 10 from the first one, but we get undefined from the second one and we see that an error was handled. So because we use console warn, this shows up as a warn line here and we get too high. So this is a simple pattern for how you might do some error handling. If you want a bit of homework, try and convert this optional wrapper into a default value wrapper, where if your function throws an error, the wrapped function will just return some default value instead of returning undefined. Make sure you keep it strongly typed though. Okay, let's look at a second example. This one is about tracking metrics, and it's kind of a riff on the latency tracker that we looked at last week. The idea here is that we have some kind of metrics client. Maybe you use New Relic or Datadog or one of the other great options out there, and you want to be able to record calls to particular functions. The example I'm using here is deprecation. Maybe we have a function that we want to phase out, and so we're gonna wait until we see the number of calls for that function go down to zero before we actually remove it from our code base. So how might this work? Well, we have a kind of mock metrics client here at the top, and then here is our metric wrapper. And of course it takes some function and it also takes a metric name. And it's pretty straightforward. We have our wrapper. This is the standard pattern that you're familiar with now. It takes parameters of function and returns the return type of function. And here it's really simple. We just call metrics client dot increment, and then we call the function. Now, maybe if this was an asynchronous function, you'd want to call it first, and if it was successful, you want to track your metric after that. That's going to be up to you in your particular use case. Now, because this metrics example is so simple, I have a few layers of higher order functions that we're going to show you here. So look at this next one here on line 14. We have a label function. And this is a function that takes some string, which is our label, and that returns a new function that takes some function and wraps it in our metrics higher order function, right? So metrics will take the wrapper, and then as you can see here, for the metric name, we include the label and then the function name. So label function itself is a higher order function because it returns a function. And you can see on line 16 here, we create deprecated, which uses label function and passes in the string deprecated. But deprecated itself is also a higher order function because it takes some function and then calls metric with the predefined metric name. So we can see finally on line 18, we have our sum function here. And then on line 19, we convert it to a deprecated sum. Now, even though we're going through multiple layers of functions here, notice that the very final version, line 19, our sum still is strongly typed. It takes two numbers and returns a number. And finally on line 21, we actually call our sum function and if I go ahead and run this, you can see in our mock metrics client, we're just logging the metrics. So you can see we have increment metric, deprecated, colon, sum, 
and we still get our value three output. So this shows you how flexible your wrapper functions can be. You can actually create wrapper functions that return other wrapper functions. And it's a great way to build up a utility library that you can use to easily sprinkle metrics throughout your code. Our next example is a little more complex. This is a memoize wrapper. The way memoizing a function works is you keep track of the return values from a function for a particular set of arguments. And if you see a call to that function with those set of arguments again, you use the cached return value instead of redoing the business logic. The example we're gonna look at here is a Fibonacci sequence generator. And this is great because a Fibonacci generator is usually recursive. And so it often calls itself with the same arguments many times throughout the generation of the sequence. So we can cut down a lot of that computation by caching the result and using the cache instead of re-performing that computation. So our memoize wrapper here takes two arguments. Obviously it takes the function that we're going to memoize, and then it takes a to key function. The idea here is that this to key function will take the parameters of the function that we pass in and convert them to a string in some way. And this is so we can basically serialize the parameters so we can look up the return value in the dictionary later. Speaking of that dictionary, we have our record of values here. This is going to map from our string, which is the output of to key, to some return type of the function that we pass in. So it doesn't really matter what the response value is, we can keep track of that type and make sure this values map is strongly typed. Then we have our actual return value here. And of course it takes the parameters and returns the return type of the original function. So step one here is to find the key. Basically for this set of arguments, let's serialize them. And then we look at that key in our cache of values. Now if it exists, we can just return that. There's no need to re-perform the original computation because we've already done it, we can just return it. However, if the value does not exist, then we will perform that computation on line 12. You can see this is where we call our function. We'll cache it in our values map, and then we'll return the value. So memoizing a function like this is a pretty simple thing to do, but it can have huge performance improvements in cases where you can do it. Now, the important thing here is that the function that we are memoizing needs to be a pure function in the mathematical sense of pure. Basically what that means is for a given set of arguments, this function will always return the same return value, something like a sum or really any mathematical function, including the Fibonacci sequence that we're gonna see here. Um, but there are other examples too. For example, concatenate two strings is always gonna return the same response. And there's other more complex logic that you can do in a pure function, of course, as well. So let's see this in action. We're gonna actually see the benefits here because I have two versions of Fibonacci here. First one on line 18 is just your normal Fibonacci function. It calls itself recursively, but it does not memoize the response at all. Now Fib2 here does memoize the response, and I'm putting it right in line here so that we can immediately call the memoize version Fib2, and that way we actually get our memoize functionality. And you can see we have our get key here, which really just takes the number that we pass in and converts it to a string. So nothing fancy there. Now, we have a nice cameo here from our latency function. You remember we built this in last week's video, and this is just gonna see how long our function call takes. And so we are using it as well to wrap our top level calls to fib. So we have fib timed, which wraps the unmemoized Fibonacci sequence, and then we have fib two timed, which wraps the memoized version of Fibonacci. So we're gonna call these both for the number 40. Let's go ahead and run this, and it takes a second or two to run, you can see the logged value that we get in response is the same for both of them, but the unmemoized fib takes two seconds, whereas the memoized fib takes almost no time at all. The final example that we're gonna look at here is using a wrapper function to create an in-memory read-through cache. Now, that sounds fancy, but you might wonder, well, is it that much different from our memoize example? And the truth is not really that much different. There's two things that we're gonna do differently. Firstly, we're gonna make this work for asynchronous functions. Now an asynchronous function usually means a network request, database lookup, and so it's unlikely to be a pure function. It's possible, but pretty unlikely that it will be a pure function. However, that's where the second difference comes in. We're gonna give ourselves a way to invalidate a particular record in the cache. This could be useful when you have an expensive database request that is often the same, but occasionally changes. You can use the cached value for most of your calls, but then if you know you make a write to something that would change the outcome of that response, you can use our invalidate hook to invalidate it and make sure we make the full call on the next read. So let's take a look at what this means. 
We, of course, start with our async function definition here, really just any arguments and returns a promise of any. And then we have this cache return type. And this cache return type has some asynchronous function as its generic parameter. Don't let these parentheses confuse you here. The first part of it is cache return is a function. It's a function that takes the parameters of fn and returns the same value of fn. You remember we saw this trick in last week's video where we have to wrap our return type in awaited and then again in promise to make sure TypeScript understands that this will return a promise. But then we're using an intersection to merge, if you will, this function with an object. So essentially we're saying this function is going to have an invalidate method on the function that takes the same set of parameters and just returns void. So overall, our cache return is a function that we can call with the same parameters of fn and get the same response value of fn, but it also has an invalidate method on it. And that's the hook in to be able to invalidate the cache. So let's see what the implementation looks like. We take our function, of course, and we also take our get key. This is pretty similar to memoize. Actually, a lot of this is similar to memoize. You can see we have our cache here, which is where we're gonna keep track of those values. And then we return our function. Now, instead of just returning it immediately, we're assigning it to this constant here, ret function. It takes the arguments we would expect, returns that same return type. We start by trying to figure out, do we have this value in the cache? So we use the arguments to get the key. And if it's not in the cache, then we go ahead and assign it to the cache. And of course, because we are expecting fn to be an asynchronous function, we have our await call here. And at this point, we have the value in the cache and then we can just return the value in the cache. So this is basically memoization, right? There's nothing special here, nothing different from our previous example. But then we add the invalidate method to our ret function. Quick side note, if you're not familiar with this idea in JavaScript, Functions are just objects, and so they can have methods just like every other type of object has methods. So the idea here, though, is that we pass some set of arguments. Notice it's the same set of arguments that the function itself would expect. We'll use that to get the key, and then we delete that record in the cache. And so now the cache no longer has a record for that set of arguments. Finally, we return our ret function, which has the invalidate method, and this will be the cached version of our function. So let's take a look at sum and log here, which is again, a little bit contrived, but you get the idea. We are immediately calling cache, but the anonymous function that we pass in takes two numbers and returns a promise of number, and it will just console.log running the original function and then return promise.resolve of a plus b. So this is kind of mocking a database call. And we include our console log here so that we can see in our example when we're actually calling the original function. So down here in the last bit of code, we can see we're calling summon log twice, then we're invalidating it, and then we're calling summon log a third time. Uh, and notice, of course, in all of these examples, we're passing it the same set of arguments. So if we go ahead and run this, you can see we have running the original function and then 300. So that corresponds to our line here on 33. Then for 34, we just see our 300. So we're not running the original function, we're using the cached value. Finally, we call invalidate, which doesn't have any output. I guess what we could do is maybe just throw a console.log here and say invalidate and print out the args like that. Let me clear the console and let's run this again. So you can see now, after the first two 300s, we invalidate our cache. And then finally, we call sum and log one last time. And those are the last two logs here, running original function and then 300. So those are a couple of examples of how you can use wrapper functions to augment the behavior of your own code. Hopefully the variety here has shown you the flexibility and the power behind wrapper functions and has given you some inspiration on how they might be useful in your own code. I'd love to hear about your examples. So definitely tell me about those in the comments and thanks for watching.